In this video, we delve into the chilling case of Marco Bergamo, a notorious serial killer who terrorized his victims and left a lasting impact on their families and communities. We examine Bergamo's modus operandi, the psychological factors that may have driven him to commit his heinous crimes. Marco Bergamo, serial killer guilty of killing five women between 1985 and 1992. Many have always had doubts about two cases attributed to him and you can find his case here. You will find information about his life, murders, arrest, and trial. You will also find the hypothesis contemplated by some that it would not be his two murders attributed to him but to another serial killer who would have acted in the same area and in the same period. Marco was born on August 6, 1966, in Bolzano. His childhood was very difficult and lonely. Communication with peers is severely limited due to language delay, which was diagnosed at the age of four. Young girls of his age scare him, they seem smarter and more self-confident than him and this scares him because he does not know how to communicate with them. As a teenager, the situation does not improve because he is obese and also starts suffering from psoriasis. He has practically no friends, so he engages in lonely hobbies, including photography, walking, and knife collecting. He never leaves home without at least one in his pocket. The methods with the girls are getting more and more difficult, he is unable in any way to approach and try to beat her. During this period he began to use different methods of masturbation, from pornographic magazines to voyeurism and collecting women's clothing. All things replace actual intercourse with another human being, though it is sometimes consumed by intercourse with prostitutes on an occasional basis. Although he managed to obtain a short emotional sting, he wouldn't be able to consume it for fear of destroying something that wasn't defined better. According to him, the woman is a vile being, a kind of selfish praying mantis that uses a man, eating him like a cigarette before getting rid of him. He is against the bond of marriage because he considers it to formalize this power over the man. The only woman he always interacts with is his mother, whom he has an idealized vision of as a loyal, devoted, respectful, and altruistic woman. His ideal woman should be like his mother, which is an indication that he never succeeds in obtaining a realistic and mature vision of the female character as a companion rather than as one who merely takes care of her. Some scholars argue that men who become incest are conditioned by the poor relationship they had with their mothers from an early age. Marco is denying this theory. He loves women, but only those who look like his mother. In adulthood, he experienced another trauma in May 1992, at the age of 26. He had his testicles removed which made dealing with women particularly difficult. Not because of sexual problems but because of the already latent fear of the whole woman. It works mainly in manual jobs but it is never stable. He works as a carpenter, handyman and welder in a mechanical workshop. Often changes jobs due to absences and layoffs without excuse. Despite the difficulties in terms of work and theft of underwear, he is not subject to procedures, convictions and any kind of hospital treatment for his problems. He performs his compulsory military service without major problems. His former comrades describe him as strange and very secretive. Appointed as assistant cook in San Candido, Bolzano. Hence the testimony claiming that he was somnambulistic and often devoted to self-eroticism thanks to pornographic tabloids. The first murder, Marcella Casagrande. The first murder attributed to Marco is that of Marcella Casagrande. Marcella was 15 on January 3, 1985, when she was found murdered on the floor of the house. Marcella is enrolled in the first year of the Giovanni Pacoli Teaching Institute in Bolzano and she gets to know Bergamo in a photo shop in the city even though they both live in the same street, Via Della Visitazione. Marco Di Lay takes courage from her and proposes to show her a new camera. He shows up at her house around 3 p.m., as agreed with her, and she lets him in, she's alone because her family is at work. They have at least an hour since her mother is a kindergarten teacher and she wouldn't be back until 4 p.m. Marco shows Marcella the camera and is happy because he is finally able to have a conversation with a girl. Her happiness does not last long as at 3.30 p.m. the phone call arrives from Katia, a friend of Marcella, who suggests that they go shopping together in a store. 
Marco tries to talk her out of going but she says she has to go. At that moment he loses his mind and pulls out one of the many knives that he decided to bring with him that day. The dynamics of the murder reveal that the killer is familiar with the knife and has an excellent knowledge of human anatomy. Marcella was attacked from behind. The first stab wound hits her in the back. The others to the head, neck, trunk, and arms. In all, Marco inflicted 21 stab wounds on her. The panties are shredded but the genitals are intact and there are no signs of sexual assault. The murder of Marcella Casagrande will go unsolved for seven years, until Marco confesses to the murder shortly after his arrest in August 1992. Investigations towards some sexual maniac. The second murder, Anna Maria Cipolletti. On June 26, 1985, Marco went to the home of Anna Maria Cipolletti, a 42-year-old former middle school teacher. Anna Maria leaves teaching at the minimum retirement age and starts prostituting herself under the name of Morella. She receives her clients at home, she is a high-profile prostitute. This crime is attributed to him during the trial and he has always declared himself extraneous. Anna Maria was killed with 19 stab wounds, violently. The killer used a switchblade with a blade at least 8 centimeters long. The first stab was inflicted on the back but managed to reach the heart, while the others all hit the chest, especially the breast area. The victim's undergarments, as well as money, were taken away. Another anomaly is that the killer also tried to strangle Anna Maria with a rope. At the trial, an agenda found in Anna Maria's house was shown, in which she marked the appointments. The diary reads of many appointments with a certain Marco. In an appointment two years earlier, when Marco was about 17, there was written, Marco. Sent away. There are many doubts about this murder, starting with where Marco could have gotten the money to go with a prostitute of a certain level. The other big question is the attempt to strangle Anna Maria with a rope, why this particular action? These doubts have never been clarified. The third murder, Renata Rauch. On January 7, 1992, the body of Renata Rauch was found. Renata is a 24-year-old young woman from Bressanone. She is a drug addict and for this reason she starts prostituting herself at the age of 16. She frequents the square of a petrol station near Bolzano Station, an area known for its prostitutes at night. Marco will confess to this murder after being shown the note on the flowers as proof. The confession will help rebuild the dynamic. In the evening between the 6th and the 7th of January, he goes with his red CD Biza to the square in search of a prostitute with whom to have a complete relationship. At that moment he sees Renata, with whom he had already had a meeting before. She loads her in the car and they separate from her but she would refuse a full report and for this he kills her. He hits her in the neck, shoulders, head, and back. In all, there are 24 of her stab wounds. Marco goes to Renata's funeral and leaves a bouquet of flowers on the grave with an anonymous folded note, I'm sorry but why it did had to be done and you knew it. Bye, Renata. The message is written in very different characters, mixed uppercase and lowercase as if to mislead. The fourth victim is Renata Troger, 19, killed on the night of March 21, 1992. She is hitchhiking on the road between Presanone and Bolzano when she meets her killer. Marco denies that he is the murderer and the following reconstruction is the one offered by the public prosecution. Renata would have gotten into the car with her killer, who would have attempted a sexual approach. Feeling rejected, she would first attempt to strangle the girl and then stab her in the chest, abdomen, and throat. In all the stab wounds would be 16 and made with a kitchen knife. There are no signs of violence, the underpants are not shredded and some still today have some doubts about Marco's involvement in this murder. The parents know that their son suffers from sleepwalking but guarantee that when these episodes happen, they can hear him and stop him. That evening they hear nothing and the son could hardly have gone out, driven, killed a young girl and then returned home covered in blood and not making any noise. The other anomaly is the attempted strangulation of the victim, just like in the case of Anna Maria Cipolletti a murder he denies ever having committed. The fifth murder, Marika Zorzi. The latest murder is that of Marika Zorzi. 
Marika is 19 years old and lives in Leeds with her mother and two sisters. Marika leaves the house and goes to the station in Bolzano, accompanied by one of his sisters. That same evening Marco is out to celebrate his birthday, on August 6, 1992, he turns 26. Marco meets her at the station and lets her up. They go together towards the hill, a small mountain outside Bolzano, perfect for seclusion. The problem is that Marco underwent testicle removal surgery three months before her so he has difficulty having a relationship with her. According to his version, she would have started to mock him and to refuse to have a relationship and this would have unleashed his murderous fury. She takes the knife available that night, a serrated bread knife that is on the back carpet, and starts smacking her inside the car. He hits her in the torso, arms, and hands with a total of 26 stab wounds. However, Marika fought hard, because, at the scene of the crime, the police found a window deflector, the interior rearview mirror, and a window pane. Her fury was of no avail because he abandons her dying and half-naked on the side of the road where she bleeds to death half an hour later. The Capture of Marco Bergamo The alarm goes off and in about six hours Marco is stopped on the outskirts of the city for a routine check, but the police become suspicious when they see that the seat is broken in and there are traces of blood all over the interior of the car. In the trunk, they find Marika's clothes and wallet, as well as the blood-smeared front seat cover. He immediately confesses to the murder but as soon as he arrives in prison he tries to commit suicide by cutting his veins with a piece of glass. He is rescued in time and manages to save himself. Prosecutors suspect he may be behind the unsolved murders in the area. The investigations lead to connect Marco to four other murders thanks to serious indications of guilt. The knife he says he used to kill Marika Zorzi is covered in blood but doesn't match the weapon used to kill her. His handwriting is compared with the note left on Renata Rauch's grave and it coincides with the note left by Marco himself. At home, they find a green and blue anorak with bloodstains on the right pocket, a jacket that could not have been worn in the summer to kill Marika Zorzi. In the car, there are several newspaper articles, especially regarding the death of Marcella Casagrande. A rope in the luggage leads the investigators to believe that he may also be involved in the murder of Renata Troger. The trial against him is for the murder of the five women. Marco pleads guilty to three murders but will always deny any involvement in the cases of Anna Maria Cipolletti, the second victim, and Renata Troger, the fourth victim. His extraneousness to other very similar murders that took place in the area and in the same period is established. On March 8, 1994, Marco Bergamo was convicted of all five murders, including Cipolletti and Troger due to similarities with the other three. Bergamo has always declared himself innocent and has always reported that whoever committed them is potentially much more dangerous than him. Marco's father, Renato Bergamo, upon hearing the news that the television program would broadcast a trial against Marco, committed suicide on April 18, 1994. He will spend the rest of his life in various prisons, obtaining only a few short leave but never a state of semi-probation or similar. In September 2017 he falls ill and is transferred to the hospital, where he will enter a coma and died on October 17, 2017. He pleaded guilty to only three murders until his death. What if he's really innocent of two murders? The murder of Renata Troger Regarding the murder of Renata Troger, there would be a great doubt, given that the parents have always sworn that their son had not gone out on the evening of the murder. The mother confirms that Marco Bergamo has periods of sleepwalking but being able to go out at night without being hurt or seen to kill a young woman without leaving a trace in the house is really unlikely. The words of Marco's mother will be worth little, the case will be attributed to him without any doubt, as well as the others, being convicted for this too. The Murder of Anna Maria Cipolletti Anna Maria Cipolletti was 42 years old when she was killed on June 26, 1985. The investigations into the case lead to many interrogations of friends and acquaintances, but no arrests. Anna Maria had been a teacher but asked for and obtained early retirement, starting to engage in prostitution under the name of Morella. The interesting point of this case is that Anna Maria tried to defend herself with her hands and feet. 
Her tiller definitely used a switchblade with a blade about 7 cm long and about 1.5 cm wide. He also washed in the bathroom before leaving, leaving several traces of his passage through the house. A neighbor would have heard a scream between 8 and 8.30 p.m., the probable time of death. Anna Maria had also received threatening phone calls a year before her death and was afraid. At the time of the case, newspaper articles spoke of similarities between the case of Anna Maria and five other crimes committed in the area. Was it possible that there were two serial killers acting in the same period and in the same area of Bergamo? It's not as improbable as we'd be inclined to think, it's happened several times in history. Murder of Renata Rauch Killed on January 7th and the funeral took place on January 13, 1992 in the Cathedral of Bolzano. A hundred people, including friends and relatives, took part, but no one gave importance to who was present. The officiant made no mention of the tragic event, referring only to the episode of the repentant Magdalene, because being a prostitute must have been the fault that led her to that end. Sadly, victim blaming is still too common today. A trail that is little mentioned by those in the area is the one that leads to the fact that a few days before the murder she had been attacked by some young men who asked her for a slight. Another little cited lead is the one given by a phone call to the Rye editorial staff of the radio news. A stranger claims that Renata was killed by a woman. The report would have come to the stranger from a prostitute who would have claimed that the fatal stabbing would have taken place in revenge. The killer would be the wife of a customer infected with AIDS. This track is investigated because some elements suggest it could be true. Deputy Prosecutor Paul Ranzi who is leading the investigation hopes to obtain useful information from the analyzes made on the blonde hair found on the victim's shirt and between the fingers which could belong to the murderer or assassin. There are no clues to say that Renata was affected by AIDS or at least it seems unlikely. The trace of hair could represent a link between the crime committed in Bolzano and the one committed in nearby Trento and which saw the fatal stabbing of 38-year-old Anna Maria Ropil who would have been noticed the day following the crime in Bolzano, a few hours before his death in the company of a blonde. There is also talk of a black Mercedes that would have been noticed several times during the day of the crime in Trento near Ropil's home. Given the overlapping of clues which however continue to remain very vague, the prosecutor has decided to make a change. He has decided to set up a pool of investigators made up of at least a dozen carabinieri and policemen. The goal is to perfect coordination between law enforcement by engaging the best men exclusively on this case. The coordination of forces will not lead to much because Bergamo will be taken in August 1992, therefore all other hypotheses on the Renata case will fall apart and no one will ever arrive at a solution for the Anna Maria Ropil case. The murder of Anna Maria Ropil The trace of hair could represent a link between the crime committed in Bolzano, Renata Rauch, and the one committed in nearby Trento and which saw the fatal stabbing of 38-year-old Anna Maria Ropil, who would have been noticed the day following the crime of Bolzano, a few hours before his death in the company of a blonde. There is also talk of a black Mercedes that would have been noticed several times during the day of the crime in Trento near Ropil's home. More unsolved homicides in the area Franz Masoner, the night porter of the Hotel for the Poor in Bolzano, was stabbed to death on January 24, 1985. Joseph Messner, another hotel porter, from Laves, was stabbed on November 4, 1985. Walter Burnaby, 34 years old, the traffic policeman, was killed with a knife on December 9, 1986. Other suspected cases Marco Bergamo's involvement is also suspected of three crimes committed in Veneto, where he spent his holidays with his family. On July 15, 1987, in Padua, a 27-year-old pregnant woman named Philomena Odierna was stabbed to death. The murder weapon, a scuba knife, was found. On August 10, 1989, it was the turn of the 39-year-old prostitute, Gloria Ruffo, who was shot and killed in a farmhouse along the Jessalana State Road in the Venice hinterland. Two people were first accused of this crime, but were acquitted. On January 30, 1991, 42-year-old Sandra Casagrande was killed in the Treviso area, stabbed inside her pastry shop during the night, while she was intent on packing favors. 
the judiciary of Bolzano asked the Austrian gendarmerie for data relating to some prostitutes killed in recent years in Innsbruck. Through Interpol, it was learned that a 26-year-old student in Paris was allegedly murdered while he was there. In the end, they caught a monster, he had to be the one and only one because thinking of being able to have two on the loose was too much for the investigators of the time. Personally, I believe that Marco Bergamo's problems have prompted him to admit crimes, not his, but we will probably never find out who else acted in the area in a similar way to him. There are a lot of doubts and opinions about it. I expect you to leave us your opinion and knowledge of this in the comments. Thank you for watching this video on Marco Bergamo and the impact he had on his victims and their families. We hope that this exploration has shed some light on the complexities of criminal psychology and the devastating consequences of violent crime. If you found this video informative, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to our channel for more true crime content.